All right, guys, we got a nifty guest today, Mr. Barefoot Sprinter, Graham. Um, you don't wear blue, do you? Oh, I do wear blue. This is just, I thought you, you're, you, you're a nifty guest. Um, I thought we shouldn't, uh, maybe we shouldn't, we probably shouldn't talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah, we should talk about how red this shirt is and how beautiful it is. I got this from, a, I'm not sure, I got this from my closet. But Barefoot Sprinter's the guest, amazing, very athletic, very fast. And he doesn't wear shoes, so... Um, no, I do wear shoes, just functional shoes. But speaking of athleticism, it's just crazy. Like, I watch you jump. Like, just watching you lift, it was like, what, I had to count the plates in the trap bar. You picked it, I'm like thinking it's going to be a struggle. It was like seven plates, right? Oh, yeah. Well, just, How, yeah. What yeah. is that? Seven times? Uh, seven plates, uh, you know, you know I'm not good at math. 630, that's, that's about 700 pounds. Seven and you did it for a triple. But you no, I did it, it for five, three sets of five. Three sets of five, but you pick it up so quick. Yeah, well, uh, Joe Sullivan is my coach, and he programs a lot of interesting stuff. So we did a whole warm. This is going off topic, but no, yeah, this is the topic. Yes, yes, yes. So People basically, he his training is very unique. I'm I'm trying to build my vert. I'm trying to stay athletic. That's why we're going to get into that with you because you're very athletic and you have you put out a lot of great content. You've probably seen it, but I don't want to be. I want to be a functional bodybuilder. I want to be jacked, and I want to be tan, and I want to be able to move. I want to be able to run, have great mobility. You never go in the sun, though. You're the whitest guy I know. Well, we're, we're, um, why don't you just go out in the sun? Because I get burnt. Yeah, you're going to ease into it, but like from 10 to 11, just go out and lay out there for a little bit. That'd be nifty. Yeah, that, that would be nifty, but maybe I could tell Casey about that, get a little break, get a little tan break. But, or I could take injectable melanotan, amino asylum, if you want to give us no. an anabolic code, let us know. Sun. Mm. It's free. I got a code for the sun. It's called vitamin D. It's called get outside. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Always <laughs> cheat. Always find the shortcut. Never go the long way. It's never worth it, and it takes too long. But, back to the training. Yeah, Joe Sullivan has me do a lot of stuff to get my heart rate up, get my cardio good, because earlier in the year, I was... Oh boy, I was I was fat and out of shape. I couldn't do shit. I couldn't even barely sleep and get out of bed. So he has me doing like intervals. Like, what did we do, Wyatt? We did like you ten can't rounds. Sleep because you're drinking monsters at eight o'clock at night. I've had seven hundred milligrams of caffeine today. It's two thirty in the afternoon here, three o'clock, and he's having that. That's that's why he can't sleep. Just Who to be are clear, you, Andrew Huberman. I'm a Huberman husband, but I found out that's a thing. Apparently, I saw my my girlfriend showed me this reel. It was that uh, you go through all the lists that she does, like this biohacking stuff. Is they're called Huberman husbands. They they uh, optimize their life based off of the latest science. Don't believe all science. If it works, <laughs> don't fix it. <laughs> it's working for me, so I'm not gonna try to fix anything. I like monsters. We're sponsored by Monster. Get your Monster Super Training Gym free Saturday and Sunday, nine to one. But yeah, the warm up we did yesterday, you could ask why we did 15 sets of med ball vertical toss, supersetted with one eccentric pull up. I've seen you do them. And before that, we did 3,200 M's, two yeah. miles on the sprinter bike, just legs, nasal breathing, or I could do 3,200 M's? <laughs> meters? It's not rocket science, okay? Yeah, but it's, do I believe, is, is rocket science okay to believe? No, it's not <laughs> rocket science. You got to simplify it. I, all I saw in my program was 3200M. I dropped out of college. It doesn't matter. But you made it to college. That's something. Yeah, I you did. You graduated high school. Yeah. I, Give yourself some credit. You know what the M stands for? Uh, why it films inform <laughs> me that it stands for two miles. Do you know what the M stands for in 3200M? No, it doesn't matter. The point is, the point is, I the point is, I had an option. It doesn't matter, Bear. See, this guy always fucking roasts me. The point is, the point is, the point is. How did you make it out of high school? It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. You don't need to know how to read when you can lift and get jacked as well. Well, you can read. M, you got the letter, but what does it stand for? I don't fucking know. How Mastodon. do you know he didn't mean 3,200 miles? Well, at first I thought it was 3,200 minutes, and I was like, that just doesn't add up. That just doesn't. Thir thir Do you know what the abbreviation for minute is? <laughs> yes, it's M. No, it's not. The, what is it? You tell me. M-I-N. Min. Okay, min. Do you know what the abbreviation for miles is? M. No, M-I. Okay. Do it. I, Again. It, it might work, but it's a different. There's imperial system in the... Um, 
uh, what's the U what's the US version? It's Imperial and Metric. Oh yeah, yeah. Imperial and then there's the metric system, which is the thing that you probably don't even wear. Okay, well you're talking to a guy that doesn't even count the weight. I go by plates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's the opposite of pounds? What's the what's the European version of pounds? I'm not in How school do they anymore. It? How do they measure pounds? They, if you went to how how would a European say how much weight you lifted yesterday? God, uh, you're just making me feel fucking retarded. You are. I'm just Excuse saying. Excuse my language again. Casey loves that word, but I don't want to get canceled. Well, I mean, never mind. Okay, carry on. Athleticism. Okay, athleticism. You threw balls in the air. You did some pull-ups. 15 rounds of throwing the ball in the air as high as you can. Uh, eccentric pull-ups. And before that, getting back to the M, I had the option of doing 3200M, nasal breathing, sprinter bike, legs only, or 10 rounds of... Full sprinter bike, using my arms, 10 second sprints, superset with 10 push ups, 10 rounds of that. Obviously, I'm a meathead, so I chose the slow uh, little. How jog. do you measure distance in America? What are you talking what about? Do you, what's the unit of measurement to say? Hey, God how, bless how, America. How long is the football field? 100. 100 what? Fucking yards. Okay, good. What's the European version of a yard? This is America. I know, but what's the rest, the entire rest of the world, how, what's their version of a yard? I don't pay attention to what's not relevant to me. I'm in America, that's what the fuck I worry about. America. America first. Yeah. Can't even president. You're, thank you. We don't need, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to get political on this podcast. I don't even know what politics are. I just mind my business and be a good person. <laughs> Remember that. But, uh, yeah, so. You're a Republican. Yeah. Joe Sullivan, um, Joe Sullivan is just a great man. To be honest, uh, he, he, yeah, he has me doing a lot of cool stuff now. I told him that I want to just be more athletic, and that's why we have this man sitting right here. Cause but it's silly because he can jump. You can dunk, right? Yeah, yeah. It's stupid. It is stupid. I was sitting there watching him. He just, like, walked up to something that's about 30, about 40 inches off the ground, just popped straight leg, landed on top of this thing, and just hopped off and just kept going. Uh, and yeah. so that's athleticism to me, the ability to have command of your body to do whatever you want. And you have this ability to just explosively do whatever. Yeah. And I don't even know how, like, it's just like, have you always been like that? Yeah, I have always been like that. I've always been able to jump and move no matter what weight I am. Right now I'm about too fat. Too under, small, that's what you are. You fucking, <laughs> uh, body dysmorphia is a whole other topic. We talked about it with Encima. Check that episode out. But, um, yeah. Uh, athleticism. I've always been able to jump. I love jumping. I've always been able to move side to side. I still feel like, I don't know if you would know this, my body type, my muscle type, I don't know anything. Okay. I'm just a meathead and I just enjoy it. But I've always been, I always felt like I'm better at explosive movements than I am any type of slow eccentric bodybuilding movement. I just, I don't know. It's just weird. Like, Deadlifts, sumo deadlifts, box jumps, uh, box squats. I'm able to create like a weird amount of tightness that feels like it signals for my brain, but I can't do that with other slower exercises. It's just weird. But yeah, I've always been able to move, jump, but I don't know. Well, I, I don't I know came if from this baseball, is a thing. Skateboarding and um, skateboarding. Yeah. You look like if you lost 100 pounds, you'd be a decent skateboarder build. Okay. I'm not sure exactly how you describe this, but I think there is a difference between like an anaerobic predisposition and an aerobic predisposition. I come from the other side, which is doing aerobic stuff is just very second nature and easy. Like I can get my conditioning back up like that. It's very simple. I struggle to be exposed. So that's why, ironically, I'm working on that. I, but then I see you do it so effortlessly, and I'm like, well, whatever. I think there's some genetic predisposition to that. But I don't know exactly how much truth there is to that. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, because I don't really. I don't, I, it's like aerobic responder versus anaerobic responder. You obviously do that. Hyper responder to steroids. But I've never, yeah, I've never trained for any of that. Hyper responder to education. That's Ooh. a fact. But go buy this program at barefootsprinter.com. If you could put my brain in your body, I think you would be. I think he might have something there. Let's, uh... But I also do wonder on occasion, like, there's like this, I always think about like this cerebral versus physical athletes. Like, I tend to be one of those, like, I'll sit there and think about it. I'm like, mm, oh. I'm going to hesitate. I'm like, I could get hurt doing that. I think too much. And I think the less brain activation you have, the more you just physically, just like, <laughs> animalistically. What go. are you trying? 
I'm not saying that this is pejorative. I'm simply, you know, that means negative. I'm not saying that this is a, uh, a slight towards you. I'm simply saying that you have less inhibition from your brain interfering with your body. Whereas I have a lot of inhibition and I say, that makes sense. I could jump, but I could get hurt, I could trip, and you're just like, boing. Yeah, yeah. You don't really the, question it. You just, you just do and you then come to me later to figure out how to get it out of it. Yep, yep. The, the shirt, think less. I took that to heart. I always think less. I try to do that. A lot. I don't this, think you try to do it. I think that's that's your natural state. Yeah, it's just my natural uh, natural habitat, whatever you want to call it. But especially in the gym, I tend to overthink other things, like you know, maybe with a the female or you overthink a portion of things, and it is never the thing you should overthink. There yes. are lots of things you should overthink when it comes to women, and none of them you do. <laughs> All the things that are dangerous are going to cost you money, energy, time, and potential freedom. Yeah, yeah whatever. The things that are like, I don't know, texting or communications is very secondhand. Like, but she put a period. Man, bro, that's oh not nifty. God. That's true. That is true. It was true. lowercase. It was short. Do you know what that means? She hit me with OK. With a period. No emoji. But. Not hey, nifty. Not nifty. Shout out to Crip Mac. But listen. That's a one sided endorsement. I don't know that individual. <sighs> I don't even know what we're talking about. We haven't talked about anything. Jumps. We haven't gotten there. We, we've, we've introduced the idea that we're both here, that you're athletic, and I'm not. That I might be skating on the spectrum. But, yeah, I did have a question for you regarding the, the topic we just talked about, which was maybe being... <laughs> me, 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 what? <laughs> what spectrum? Uh, we don't need to talk about that. But um, I there, just want to think that your brain... I like to think that your brain could be trained if you just sat down and like spent 10 minutes a day just working on flexing your brain. Well, that's like I can train my body to be more athletic. I want to be more like you, and I think you should work to more physically like you. I, you got to think about this. I don't think you consider it to be a, uh, a skill set you could develop. Have you Maybe. taken mushrooms before? Oh, yeah. Psychedelics? I have. And actually, during my prep, I did, and I was the most zen most calm. Everything. Are you talking like real doses or like a gram or less? Mm, I don't know. Have you ever done that. more than three? No. Do you know a gram? Um, I took a whole chocolate bar before. Well, that could be anything because and I drove and I was tripping balls. Those are the things you don't say when you're in. in okay, yeah, I'm gonna have to cut that out. Why? That, that would be a thing legal. you overthink. You can well, get a DUI for that. Well, because then they go and they call it up, they pull up and say, "Well, young Kenneth has a record." Anyways, the point being, don't nope. incriminate yourself. You can you can offer humility or like funny things. Okay. But anyways, point though, have you taken like like I don't know. So you've never you taken only chocolate bars, but you've never taken like three, four, or five grams. No, not where I'm out of control. That might be good for you to kind of like just in a safe space with Wyatt Films, watching you not doing it because neuro the uh, psilocybin is one of the only things you've been shown to regrow uh, neurons, like neural it's a neural growth factor, so it actually makes you smarter. Not like it, it increases your brain capacity. Growth factor. But your brain, you're also 22. Yep. You get three years for your brain fully connected. Mm. So there's hope that you'll be a little smarter. But I want you to think about that as something you could train. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm definitely uh, interested in that. But again, I, th I think one of my superpowers is to think less. All right. There's a value, but and if, if you're a hammer, if you're only a hammer, Guess what happens when you need a what? No, never mind. No, <laughs> if you're only a hammer and you need a screwdriver, what do you do? I want to be. I want to do the fucking around here. I know that, but sometimes that happens with screwdrivers or a saw. They just understand that there's okay. pieces of like having a toolkit. Mm, toolbox. You're calling and me a fucking tool. No, you are a tool. I wish you'd be a toolbox. God you didn't have it. access to many tools. <laughs> no, See, that was I get funny. It. That was good. Yeah. yeah. You don't, don't sell yourself short. I get it, but I want to ask you a question. Can I get up from this chair? Will it show? No, not really. <sighs> but I mean, if so you you've it. seen it. Oh, you're not even gonna be on this fucking video. My leg, naturally, I've had this theory. Okay, I don't know if it, it might be meathead science, but my leg, naturally, first of all, I've always had tiny little ankles, right? Tiny little ankles, and my legs naturally go this way so you, you mean they hyperextend there this is my like 
That's naturally my leg. They go so far out this way. They bow out laterally and not they also this way. Hyperextend. Just this way. Just backwards. Yeah. So like you naturally, have, it's like when if I. If you sat on the ground and lifted your feet off the flex your legs, your feet would lift? Yeah. And when I leg press, when I hack squat, everybody comments when I post it on TikTok, they'd be like, so terrible for your knees and your, and your ankles because my legs are going, I'm locking my legs out like, I sh like, I, like somebody would, but they're going so far back. My mm. knee is like back here. And I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I don't know if there's benefit to that or if you would Have know. Have you ever had any injuries? Nope. Any knee injuries? Nope. No dislocations, hyperextensions? Nope. Uh, I mean, I think the proof is in the pudding. It's like, you know, there's no such thing as like an inherently bad thing unless it causes you problems. Oh, so true. that being said, you should stop reading the comments. And second, you, there, you, you, there's. <laughs> Wyatt Films has his shirt off. Yeah, I know. I'm distracted. There's nipples, man. Mm. Um, all I'm saying is that it, there's not necessarily as... Granted, if you did get to a circumstance where you hyperextended the knee and had an issue, you know, I like physiologically, uh, ph like anatomically, it could be a problematic if you hyperextend and it causes your knees to buckle. I mean, if you've seen horror stories about stuff like that happen. Oh yeah, my buddy just had that happen. He played baseball, hyperextended his knee. Now he's trying to rehab it back. Was he doing a leg press when he did it, or he no? Was just... He was running backwards for a ball over his head. And his knee went backwards, and he flipped. So, oh. But he's bow-legged. He's this way. I'm this way. I'm back. He is out. Uh, does, that, so does any of that even fucking matter? You should learn the words. So you have what would be termed a little bit of knee hyperextension. Okay. So when you sit down, I mean, they, if you sit down on the ground with your legs out in front of you and you flex your quads, the normal amount you should have anywhere from like a half inch to an inch of ankle lift, your heels lift off the ground, a little bit of extent, hyperextension. Okay. So that's every joint should naturally have a little bit of hyperextension. If you can't fully extend your joint, then there, there are generally problems. So, okay. you know, you would think about it like that, right? So the question is, we could have a head. The question is the head of the, the femur and the uh, tibia, if in potentially, you know, there's a, it's not as simple as saying, you know, it looks like on the outside because you could just have a, a muscle sway of, let's say, your calf, an anatomy of your calf, the insertion of your hamstrings makes it look more hyperextended than it is. So my buddy who hyperextended, he's got the same thing, but he just suffers from knee dislocations and has issues with that. But he also has tremendous hamstring weakness and laxity in his glutes, so he's super flexible to an extent. So... There's a few things. It's not just like physically, do you have access to your, it, like physically, does this look bad? It's like, well, how strong are your tendons? How strong are your ligaments? What's your muscle development? What's your actual muscle anatomy? What's the bone shape look like? And then, you know, have you ever had an injury? So things aren't a problem just because they look like they'd be a problem. Okay. That's one of the things I think when you look at this biomechanical stacking the body up as though it's like Jenga blocks that have to fit, then you get to the point of you're like, the body's a little bit messier than that. Okay. Okay. That brings me a random question, but how, okay. So being, I see people that are super, super flexible. I'm, I guess I'm trying to ask how important is it? How, how important is strength for something that you're doing? Maybe that's the wrong question, but how do you balance all of them? Because there's, I see people that are super flexible, but then their body breaks down because they're not mm. strong enough. Or I see people too strong that go down that rabbit hole, and then they're not flexible. Then when they try to get in those positions, they break too. So I'm like, what? I think what you're looking at, there's a spectrum from laxity to stiffness. Yeah. So laxity is position without stability. Stiffness is stability without position, basically. You're, like, meaning, well, I, so there's a few different angles you'd look at. Um, so if someone who has, who is lax in their joint, they're super flexible, but they have no strength. But yeah. someone who has strength without any movement capacity, they're just stiff. Like they don't, they, they're, they're unable to, they're in a position of, they think they can hold that position, but they can't move any further. So that's both, you can make the argument unless you're in an extreme, in which case you could think of like Mark, where you couldn't get the bar down to his chest unless he had 315. Oh. Yeah. That works to his advantage. If you look at someone who's a contortionist, that works to their advantage, being super lax. Most people benefit from being in the middle, and I do think that you develop some level of um, uh, 
joint pliability, so like a tendon a fascial dominance in the middle where you have a healthy capacity to get into a position while still maintaining the integrity of strength there. So it's if you think about strength as the ability to, to create force, right? You can yeah. generate force. And mobility as the generate as the or flexibility as the ability to create position. Mobility is the capacity to have strength in a position. Okay. To be able to so, use that. Okay, but let's say okay, I'm bodybuilding. I have two questions. One is do you think if I started implementing basically just try to get super, super flexible. Is there any drawback to the movements I'm doing as far as creating tightness? And also, I was talking to Matt Winning, and he was saying that with training, because I see you do a bunch of different stuff, but you also do the same movements like those dead stop squats. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I got, well, it's basically with quarter squats. I, I start yeah. at the bottom and go back up. Yeah, do you, start okay. At the top quarter. So, what am I trying to say here? Do you think doing the progressive overload, training your body in the same movement patterns over and over and over, week in, week out, is going to cause more damage than no damage? Or do you think, like, what do you think? Do, do you think, what do you think about that? Do you think changing the movements up every single fucking week is smart? Because Matt Wenning said never do the always change your workouts. But then for somebody like me who's bodybuilding, I hear that. And I can't see the longevity side of what he's trying to say. All I hear is don't do progressive overload and don't progress any of your lifts. So I'm, I'm just get confused. Is there a negative to doing that? Because you uh, well, change your workout. Perspective. So, so the, the two, I mean, there's a few things. Like what, what are you working toward? What's your goal? And then there's a time perspective, time horizon, which is do you never go back and do that? So if you, do, if you work out five days a week and you do something different every single week for 52 weeks, and you repeat that next year. So if you ever go back into the same thing, meaning let's just say you don't do the same lift until like, there's a long enough time horizon. So just because we think in terms of like microcycles and mesocycles that are like, you know, three weeks yeah. or three months, it's like, okay, that's what you're thinking. Oh, I'm going to repeat this. So there, there's a few things that just like depends on what you're training for. So there's, you know, the idea of like muscle confusion, which is really just training different, is training with stimulus, getting your body uh, adapted to versus having some level of familiarity. I think there's a lot of personality difference that matters here as well. So your per what, what works for you? Meaning, so you, you could consider the answer to the question, this idea of like, figure out what's your goal, what are you working on? What's your personality type? Like, how do you find that? And then like, what is you, your biggest struggle? Meaning, if your personality type needs a lot of consistency, then you're probably gonna wanna come in and do something, get familiar with it and go back and, and do it again. Uh, there's not like a, a right or wrong way. Like uh, for me, I go in and use the training time in the gym as a time to work through things that I figured out in jujitsu or running or other things. So if bodybuilding is your sport, then you have to understand that the skill development, you doing the same thing like learning to flex your muscles happens, you're actually practicing your sport as you lift and your training, is it's all in the same space. It gets confusing when you think of like a power sport. Like... You have to think about if I do jujitsu and I go run and do other things, that's kind of the sport I'm going out to like add in variety and work on the skill. When I go into the gym, I'm trying to figure out how can I train the skill. And so oftentimes I'll find something that works for me and then I figure that out and then I go there. But a lot of times the things I'm exploring are playing with different avenues. But even then, it's not like I'm constantly doing something different and he wants to do it. I'm not doing something different for the sake of doing something different. I'm doing something different to improve on what I've figured out last time. So are you saying some of it just comes down to personal preference? Everything comes down to personal preference. The, the good workout you do is better than the perfect workout you don't do. So optimal is not a, is a fake? Not necessarily. It's just the, the point is, if I told you the optimal thing for you to do would be to, like, we, everything we do in life is a negotiation between what we're willing to do and what we want to do. And so there's like this, like, well, sorry, maybe what we're willing to do and what we have to do. I don't know, there's some willing to do, want to do, have to do, somewhere in that, make it sound cleaner. The idea is that you have a personal preference and personal distaste for certain things. If I told you your best physique would happen if you started reading 10 pages a day, you'd be like, is it okay if I read one? Or like, do Twitter feeds count? Or like, Draw. yeah. Awesome. So my point though is that like, we all literally go, we all talk about optimal and yet nobody does optimal because we have the resistance and hesitation that create, keeps us from stuck. If you were 100% willing to sacrifice everything and let go and be a, a slave to something, 
that would be optimal because then you would no longer have any type of like hesitation or, or re resistance. That's optimal. Okay. If I could, if I could literally put down optimal on a page, you do this, this, and this. Joe Sullivan's probably the closest guy that he's like willing to do whatever. Oh, Joe like, Sullivan's but a great man. those people are so few and far between because they are abandoning on all sense of like an I. They're just me is here. You, you train me. Yeah. I am going to remove myself. I am going to do whatever you say. So I am affording. I'm giving you. Well, you coach me. Most of the time, though, there's a deeper psychological capacity too. So think about flexibility. Why do you, if, let's just say, let's say you had stiff hamstrings and you were laying in the back house trying to stretch out your hamstrings and you resist it. Your body, that's, that's a presentation of fear in a sense. Your body, it doesn't feel comfortable in that space. Yeah. So what happens? Like you can only force your body to do so much. That's why there's an entire level of like emotional, psychological or development as well that is like if I can't do something, what's the emotional rejection of this thing that makes it harder? Okay, so to dumb it down in my brain, what I got was... I know you're struggling. Optimal, optimal is just where it fits for you personally. Well, there's, there's, there's absolute optimal and there's relative optimal. You know the difference between absolute and relative? Yeah. Explain them to me. Absolute is... This is how I'm going to break it down from, from my, my own brain when you said that. Absolutely optimal is you telling me this... Training six times a week, eating six meals every single day, sleeping eight hours. This is what it's going to take to be 300 pounds shredded on stage. Relative is um, just, uh, you know, it's going to be hard for me to explain. But in my head, I just see it as relative to my life and my structure and what I like to do. So if he tells me that the absolute whatever is eight hours of sleep, I know I don't get eight fucking hours of sleep. I get like four, so I'm not going to do that. So it's relative, right? Actually, that's pretty good. I could give you the Let's absolute go. plan, which is like, this is the perfect structure if you follow this to a T with every single detail lined out. But I could say, knowing you, you're not going to do this. So the relative thing would be to get you from where you are one step above that. So a relative good, so that, that's the point is like, Optimal, there's absolute optimal and relative optimal. What's optimal for the goal you have is not going to be optimal for what you'll do because you have a certain amount of prejudice and personality and you like to, you've got distractions that, you know, yeah. uh, that exist in your life. Right. If I told you the optimal thing to do would be to not talk to girls for five years and just focus on yourself, you go, I only talk to one girl. But that's my point though, is you are now hedging. You don't, you don't actually, this is the thing, people don't actually want to succeed. They want to succeed with, they, they, it's a negotiation between like, I, I, this is what I would, if I did this, there is 100% chance I would be successful. You but should. there's a negotiation where I have to give up this. Well, okay, maybe I, I'll give up these three things, but I'll hold on to that and I'll do these eight things. But like, do I realize that's, well, that's coaching. So, coaching is working with imperfect people. Okay, okay. And so you, if you, you're coaching yourself, that's where it gets messy. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Luckily, I have Joe Sullivan in my life, but, really, okay, to sum it up, Last, this I'm, I'm beating a dead horse. That was a good. No, yeah, the horse is very much kicking. Yeah, yeah. Um, relative. So if you said the absolute optimal way is to fucking throw your phone in the ocean, have no phone. I'm not gonna do that. Relative. I'm gonna have my phone. And I'm still Which gonna do the other things. The question instead. of, do you really want to be successful? You're asking. And most me. people don't. Yeah, I do. Bodybuilding. But you just said you wouldn't do the thing. Well, if you told me you're going to be a Mr. Olympia if you throw your phone away, I would send one last text to everybody and say I can't have my fucking phone. So now that's one of those things where it's a relationship of trust. Like, because people say, well, you can't prove this to me. And it's like, okay. Then you get the, there's the resistance of like, well, are you asking for my perspective as a coach that the biggest problem you have is this? It's like, you know, it's the... Um, it's that, you remember that, uh, there's this, this, I think it actually came on a podcast, the guy does these, uh, uh, these inspirational things like, young man wanted to be successful. I told him, meet me out of the ocean. I went out there at 6 a.m. <laughs> looking out. Yeah. I told him, walk in the water. Like, yeah. That kind of thing is like, those are the ideas like when you go through boot camp and Marines is like, and not that I have, I know I have a haircut, but the point is it's like, they are breaking you down to say like, this is my rifle, without me, I am, without my rifle, I am nothing, without me, my rifle is nothing. They, they like, they are stripping of the I. There is no more of this. this uh, you know the difference between I and me? I is, no, me is me. I, it, there's no team in I. 
There's no I in team. Just explain. Just fucking explain it, please. You kind of get there. So the best way, if you ever struggle to figure out what a word means, use it in a sentence. I like kratom. The bodybuilding training split that Joe Sullivan made me is for me. Okay, perfect. Now the difference. I like. That's an ego identity. Psychological. I have a girlfriend. I talk to this way. I like wearing red. I think this is cool. Me is your threat detection. It is your body. It is this thing that exists and lives. So think about it like that. Me likes kratom because me that like me me hungry me horny me like there's why these. Why would you say it like that? Because that's the way it is. Me horny. So if I'm talking the. That's literally how you we you got to realize we are an animal that's been hijacked by this little neurochip prefrontal cortex that sits up here that has the identity. Okay. You would be much happier is if all we just walked around. Like, look at a dog. Is a dog unhappy? No, dog's always happy. Because they don't sit here and think about, I wonder if people like me. That I wonder if people like me. Do you realize I wonder if people like me? Do you see the difference there? So I have goals. Me, you know, like the me will go and do whatever it is your dog could train, but it also is very stubborn. And so, like, the goal is to bring the I and me in alignment and understand where you're at. But... You know, sometimes you have to train. You have to do that. But the eye is this like, this, is this fickle little thing that is all over the place. The me is also can be a very stubborn thing, because mm. you get hungry. I have body dysmorphia. Me is a rab rip jack dude. That's the difference. But you, you realize the body dysmorphia. I don't see my body for reality. I am delusional about the way I perceive reality. That makes sense, but. Therefore, delusion it's a battle is an between. Aggressive word, all right. No, it is. It's, it's a delusion is a is a disconnect between reality, as and objective I'm for reality. For sure, delusional. For I sure, mean, you absolutely. Every piece of life, I'm delusional. I hope that Nikki likes me. I hope that I can get jacked for me. That's pretty good. Get jacked for me. Where you're saying me horny next time I see that was great. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that they're like they're, they're pieces of this. You break this apart. But my point is, when you understand these aspects, it's understanding that the resistance that happens. If you can figure out if there's a resistance coming from a body level that like I haven't been, the body or the body is a set of tissue. There's emotions that bring up from a knowing, from my inheritance over millions of years of like natural processes that comes from the body. You don't know how to build muscle. Your body just does it. That's like all the stuff that happens on the animalistic level. You don't know how you jump. You don't even know how you do this. That just happens. Right? Do you know what I mean? Like you just, I, I want it to happen and it does. That's wisdom within your body. I is up here. So it's starting to pay attention to these things of me is tissue. Me is smart. Me will do the things if I put myself in the right circumstance. I put me in the right circumstances, stuff happens. So you're saying I, me. Yes, and that's the classical Judeo-Christian separation of mind and body, which there is no difference because mind and body is it. I'm saying that within the, the mind... There, there are, this is where it gets kind of conf it gets more confusing because we don't quite understand. This is a hard problem of consciousness. It's like, why is there a there? Why is there a there there? Why, why, do we kind of, why do we perceive anything? You know, like, I don't know. But I can't perceive consciousness without being... It, you can only... The only way you experience conscious, like things is through consciousness. You can't disconnect from consciousness and still experience consciousness. There's an experience. That makes sense. Think about a movie. You can only watch a movie if you watch a movie. It's the idea of if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear, does it make a noise? No. <laughs> it actually doesn't because there's no one there to hear, therefore there's no perception of the noise. It's actually good. That's smart. Yeah. Um, but the point, though, is that, like, that there's an experience. And so it's not just this. You can think of it like that, but the brain and the body, your, our, our emotions come up and are expressed as parts of our body, and the brain, our, our brain, our mind, it perceives those things. But you also realize that there are many parts, there are many things that create this cocktail that is Kenny, and not all of those are necessarily working in alignment. And the more you can develop peace in your life by understanding the body that affects the mind, your gut, your nervous system, so there's your nervous system, you know what your... Uh, CNS. My CNS gets fatigued when I would power... You know what that stands for? Central nervous system. 
Good. So within that, there's autonomic and somatic. You know the difference? Nope. Somatic is active. Well, I know what autonomic means. Auto autonomic. But yeah, autonomic happens, it's, but it's from the same root word. Autonomic is the fight, flight, rest, digest, flow, freeze loosely. Mm -hmm. And the somatic is all the intentional things like this conversation. You know, we choose to do that. But you have the whole unexamined, I think I'm walking around with this whole self-authored state, but what, my, what I eat, my gut, my enteric nervous system is a big determining factor. If you eat like shit, you're, you know, the gut brain, you've heard my gut feels like this. That's your body's enteric nervous system. And then there's your, your nervous system, your brain, your autonomic nervous system, which is I get angry, you know, like things just happen. That's like the me. The me is this whole like thing that's just happening that we never really think about. So bringing that into alignment with a healthy diet is how you create space for your brain to create space for your mind to operate. It is all in the same thing. Hmm. My point, though, is you can't just say, if I go in the gym and eat this stuff, I'll be okay. You also have to bring your mind, be friends with your mind. And if you see these pieces, the mind is the influences that come in from all the stuff you consume. Your gut is the influence of all the stuff you eat. So, and your body is the influences from all the like, movements in your environment. So me is a reflection of I. And I is a reflection of me. That makes sense. That makes sense. They... You can conceptualize them as different pieces because then it allows you to start to pull away from this like overly identifying with, man, that guy disrespected me and now I'm going to beat him. It's like, okay, calm down because that is an entire, like you don't, you see people that just act in bravado. They act out of this like, this tribal I. mentality. Yeah, like, and it's, he disrespected me. It's like, you know, I'm upset. It's like, okay, hold your emotions. You look at children that can't stop crying. It's like, Calm down. It's okay. And that's when you see clients. It's funny because as a coach, if you're working with people, you're going to notice in them. It's like, man, I was doing really good, but I fell off my, I fell off the willpower, you know, or like I was tired. And this is like, and you're just like, you skipped a workout because you were tired? Yeah. Do you actually want it? Then turn around and point that lens to yourself and say, hmm, I see. Yeah. I saw that post. I screenshotted it on your story where you talked about not, you talked about, what was the quote? Um, or you, oh, you talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you talked discipline. about, you talked about maybe not pretending, but if you see somebody that you look up to or want to be like, then just do that. And I like that because I would do that a lot back in high school, even though this might not be what you're saying, but maybe I am a little bit delusional, but well, I see Larry delusional. wheels. I was watching Mark. I was watching everybody. And I would just pretend like I'm them and then do the same things as them. And then eventually I found my own path and I kind of sprinkled what I learned from that into my own stuff. And now I'm here. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. When you are struggling and you're like ah, back and forth, what would Larry Wheels do? Do you think Larry Wheels would skip leg day? No. Absolutely not. So therefore you say, well, then I'm not going to skip leg day either. And those yeah. build habits where then eventually the identity comes along. And identity takes one to two years trailing behind. But how do you do that? Because I did that, but then I feel like I started to lose my identity and then I was confused. Because you don't, well, first off, you don't, this is the other side. When you were a kid, your kids are born in, like, what identity do we have? We're literally at, we're dependents. The goal from zero to 18 is that you develop a, some, a, some form of independence, but it's untested. You go through all these periods where you're four, like, what identity do you have? You have some things that are kind of unique. You like Barney, you don't like Barbies, or vice versa, it doesn't matter. But the point is, like, you have some level of things you're testing, but you're only really, you know what you're exposed to. But how do you know if you like an Indian food if you never had it? So the point is, it's like we, we go in and we learn from people, like, we learn from people who hold on to identity because eventually as you go through these, at first you just self-identify, you are the emotions. A baby is hungry. A baby is only a me. It just is. Like a baby gets hungry, it cries. A baby is happy, it's, it laughs. A baby wets itself, it cries. That's it. Eventually you realize, oh, I have emotions, but I am these, like, you know, I am these, um, I forget what they call it, these identities. And so you start to see like, you start to go through these, these it's called uh, Kagan's theory of adult development, and you go from like, I am emotions to I have emotions and I am roles, to I have roles and I am identities, to I have identities, meaning when you go with Nikki, you'll step into boyfriend role. When you're talking here, you're trying to be all like professional role. When you go in lifting, you're, but you, you have different shades of who you are come out with different people. And then you start to realize that I am no one thing, except I'm a conglomerate of these things that are all there. And you don't attach any one thing. Different characters. You are different game. characters, exactly. 
but you step into them, just like Grand Theft Auto V, you can step in, maybe it was a different one, but you could step into different characters, and, and we all do this. We're all constantly switching masks. And there's also things you don't even realize. You, like, this is the point, I think, of Socrates or Aristotle, you can look it up, but the unexamined life is not worth living. The point is that you can start to become aware of the things that happen as you navigate the, con the conflicts of society, having to deal with impressing your girlfriend's parents or dealing with the rejection, or trying to go be a good boyfriend, or trying to be a meathead, trying to, you know, be impressive for the people that come here, like, oh, I'm cool, or trying to, like, you know, these are all the things that go on, and if you just step back and realize, that's a whole lot of turbulence, you give yourself a little more credit, and then you start to practice and realize, if you're going in and you're training all the different muscles, if you thought about, if you thought about your body as characters, just like you thought about your mind as characters, you could realize, man, my calves are lagging. That's I'm not saying they are. I don't know. You, you, the reason you have small ankles is because you have high Achilles insertions, which is why you're explosive. That's, don't get caught up with that. My point, though, was, okay, that answered my question. The point, though, is that, like, just say, for example, this arm is not as big as this arm, or vice versa. I can't say anything because you're getting all like upset about it. I'm not. This is a hypothetical. Okay. The point, though, is you could say, this is a character. This is a character. This is a character. This is a character. You know, and you could start to think about these and go, huh. What areas am I struggling with my body? Let me go train that. And so I focus and I dispersonalize and say, I'm not a failure. Like, this is part of the whole, so it does reflect on me, but I also can't improve that. So you don't, a fixed mindset would be, yeah, my left arm is just small. It sucks. Like, why'd you quit bodybuilding? Oh, my left arm is small. No one would say that because in, inherently in bodybuilding, you see a growth mindset. It's literally growth. My arms are growing. It's gains. Yeah. Now, if you thought about that for your internal spot, you think, where do I have friction in my life? Emotionally, my relationships with my parents, with my finances, with my friends, with my personal uh, follow through, with cleaning my car. You can look at all the things, and if you don't know what it is, you can ask your three to five closest friends or your family, and they will tell you real quick you're a slob, you have 50 times a relationship, you can't spell well. It doesn't matter what it is. And you start to think of that as characters. Yeah. And then you realize that you can't, I mean, there are people like you could throw 100% of focus on that, but from a well lived life, that creates a career of healthful, like a, a present calm. The thing that off, the thing that derails people from being great in careers is they run out of money, they run out of time, they run out of patience, they get burnt out, something like that. It's emotional things that ruin that. And it's oftentimes represented by injuries in their body. Rarely is everybody, is anybody just fucking crushing it and doing everything and then they get injured out of nowhere. And typically there's a pain they're avoiding, their nutrition was off, they weren't, they would stop doing, they always know what I did wrong. Yeah. The body is an expression of the interiority. And if you got more interested in the characters that were in here and started to dispersonalize and say, oh, I don't have to overly emotionally react just because my girlfriend said okay, then you could start to say, oh, well, I don't have to overly emotionally react because my left arm is not as big as my right on my DEXA scan. Guess what? You just work on it. And then you go to work. And this is the part when your brain starts to connect at age 24, 25. You'll start to see yourself and say, oh, just like it makes no point when you're 12, 11, 13, it's like, well, my boy, I don't have big muscles because you don't have testosterone. You don't have any steroids. You know, that's, that's steroids. You don't have hormones. You, don't have, you haven't gone through puberty. The same thing, don't judge yourself, but begin when you can start with a little amount of awareness and just say, huh, that is interesting. And you'll hear little things like this and you'll kick it with you and be like, huh. And you'll just go, before I would have just got so pissed off someone said that to me. Now I'm like, I feel angry, but I don't have to do that. That's, and you look at someone like Ensema, very poised, very stoic, you look oh, at Mark, yeah. they didn't, they're not overreacting. So say, no. what would Mark do? What would Ensema do? And treat yourself in those characters, and then you learn to space things out, and you develop a little more poise. Yeah, yeah, that would be uh, great to have some of that, and more uh, controlled aggression, maybe not uh... Turn your aggression into assertiveness, that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. It's okay to be aggressive. Just struggled with that younger days, but. It's not a would be great to have, it, it, that's a would be great to have in a say way you working on any of any, any this is the ironic part is that most people like you have de demonstrated a consistency a discipline and a desire to succeed you do it in a thing that feels like your identity you only identify as a bodybuilder eventually you start to realize that bodybuilder is one option but the skill set you learn in that can then be broken open into apply to relationships business. the business making money so you're not fucking broke start to think about like coaching and that's the beauty this is the difference between people learning the lesson of sports and athleticism or getting stuck there until they burn out and they become you know a, a Brett Favre figure where they can't quit 
You know, they keep yeah. going back. And so those are the things that's like, and you see these guys, they're all meatheads that are washed up and still talking about the good old days. Nice they couldn't school. quit. They didn't learn the lesson that all physical movement is supposed to train your body. So eventually your mind becomes part of, sorry, you're training your body in a way to train your mind. Your mind becomes your friend and then you express your greatest gift. You're just halfway on the equation. And now if you start to think of yourself as more than just a dumb meathead with body dysmorphia, you actually have a little bit more opportunity. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Begin. Okay. Optimal, relative. Next step is one thing at a time. Find peace. Like these are things. Read a book. Take five. Don't even read a book. Listen to a podcast. Stuff you should know. Just start to learn things. But think about yourself as though you could learn shit. Oh, I listen to podcasts every. I have uh, six to seven binders full of, uh, of podcast notes for the last three years I've been here. Uh, but I, I only listen to podcasts that. I, I could definitely expand. Are they in your identity as bodybuilder? Yes. So now you sort of think, what other roles? But that's when you think, what's my biggest problem right now? I'll tell you right now. Live with your parents on my money. Good. How do I fix that? Money. How do I make money? Business. How do I make business? Well, I have to learn people. And so then you crack that open. So you introduce it with podcast, and you think, oh, that's interesting. And so you start, you know, you could Alex Ramos, he's brilliant. He's probably ten notches above. But like, Bedros, a lot of the guys that come in here, pick a podcast and listen to one a week. Find the, sm that's another time I have, find the smallest thing, you do that, you know? Yeah. Little things, and yeah. you ask people that might be successful that know, in your network and say, what would be the next step I should think about? Who would be someone I could listen to a podcast and go from there? Pay a coach, find someone that can mentor you. It's no different than how you wanted to get started when you were a kid, wanted to be a bodybuilder, to now. It's just realizing that there are stages in life, and at some point, your limiting factor on your physical development it's going to be your money. It's going to be your ability to say no to things around, to be able to get back your sleep, and to be able to have veto power to when you don't want to work. That's optimal. Optimal is not just eating sets, reps, and food. like that'd be great. But you have to do a whole lot to protect that. And unless you get to be a sponsored athlete, you work at a professional sports club where they do all that stuff. As a am semi pro or amateur athlete, your goal is to not only be your own athlete but also be your manager, and then also to understand how do I create a cocoon so that this is a priority. Okay. That makes sense. And this is recorded, so you can listen to it again on half speed. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. That's a great life lesson right there. I'm going to have to apply that. You don't have to, but only if you want to be successful. Time out. Time out. Okay. Your feet are out. Look at those toes. Oh, my. Those feet are out. I haven't asked a barefoot question yet. You can do a part two if you don't have to, you don't have to force it all on today. I know, but I just had this question in my head because before I met you, and before being barefoot was the thing to do, um, I just felt like, well, to be honest, I just saw powerlifters do it that were like hardcore lifting heavy, like Larry Wheels would do it a long time ago. And I just saw that and it made sense. I felt more comfortable. I knew never to squat in like a fat cushion because you're not stable. I just knew little things like that, but I didn't know how important they were. So, but I know everything, even in baseball, everything's from the ground up almost I mean a lot of things are from the ground up so I just want to know how important or what could I apply that you preach and you believe in into bodybuilding just um, strong feet or well, two things do you lift with gloves no why not that's fucking I'm not gonna say that word but no I would never is there any other reason <sighs> well it's not my real grip it's not my hands I want I want my bare skin I want to be able to feel the bar I want to yeah, I want to be able to feel the bar. If it slips, I don't want to wear gloves on a deadlift. There you go. So if you think about your feet just like your hands, you have your answer. Second part is also if you move your forearms and move with your fingers. See all the muscles right there? You got about 26 muscles, 27 muscles in your forearm. Same thing for your calves. If you want to develop feet and arches that don't look like bunion and crappy on stage, if you're trying to compete at the highest level, guess what? You can't have toes that smash in and bunions and look all you know, hammer-toed. You want the same thing if you move your toes, you start to see all of the, the different muscles that engage. And so if you want strong feet and develop feet, ankles, lower legs, and a healthy arch, you need to start moving. And if you're smashing, you don't have to be barefoot, but like a vibrant five finger, that's yeah. gonna be fantastic. So aesthetically and performance wise, no difference. Hmm. So, okay, that makes sense. So then that, that means every type of cleat is bullshit then. Cause well, every... that's not bodybuilding, but yes. Well, I, even with sports, because depends. In Nike, yeah, Adidas, 
Vivo needs to come out with a cleat. Mm, well, so the problem with cleats is that there's no cleats are inherently unhealthy for feet, meaning anything that increases the traction on the ground creates a break between where the foot would naturally slide and pivot. So now what happens is the foot gets stuck, you create a torque that goes from the ankle up to the knee. So if I can't, if my hand gets stuck, then guess what? My elbow is going to go. So this is like in jujitsu, you get arm bars and stuff like that. Like they're locking the hand, the wrist, and then they're pulling the elbow. If the foot gets stuck into the ground, normally I would have some give with the finger, the toes are spread. It's even worse if the feet are smashed together. I would normally be able to rotate on the ground and slide, but the foot gets stuck, that creates a higher torque. And so you see it increasing. So everything that makes the cleat more of a cleat makes the, um, increases injury risk. Everything that makes the cleat less of a cleat, a uh, more flexible midsole, shallower studs, no heel studs, like you, that makes everything healthier. Okay. But it is, do, it does increase traction, but it's one of those things where it increases traction, like your goal's performance. Just so there's risks in taking steroids, but it improves yeah. your capacity. So it, it's a, it's a trade off and you will have a little bit, it doesn't mean you're great, but like you can decelerate and change direction better when a cleat because there's a little bit of padding and it gives you some grip on the ground, it comes at a cost. Okay, so, hmm. So is it just as simple as if people wanna get stronger feet or create more, I don't know what the word is, just get stronger feet, is it just take your shoes off? Or is How there would you get a stronger extra? grip? Train my grip. There you go, train your feet. Hold shit, lift heavy, train it. Hold things, variety. Don't use straps. Yeah, so you take away the, the support, you use them, and you add variety. You take away the support, which is the shoes, you use them, meaning you walk, you jump, you run, and you add variety, meaning you move, you stand on different surfaces. You've got 28 bones in, in your feet alone, and so those need different surfaces. They want to be, if you think about your hand, your hand and your feet are the same, they mirrors one another. They have a little bit different function over time because we stand on one and use the other for dexterous things, but you can learn to do either you know, in both roles. But if you just think about your hands, I would want to work on my fingers and get those strong. I want to work on my dexterity. I would want to work on my position. And then I just want to expose some different things. And so if you think about training, it's like starting with less restrictive shoes, give it good to get some bend into that to, to get the tissue more pliable and mobile. Then you start to build up from there with just different variety, different texture, running, jumping, et cetera. Okay, so it's the same thing as lifting. This is the thing. When you can distill a complex thing down to a simple principle, you're close to the truth. Okay, okay. So last meathead question. The Tibbs. Meat foot question. I just saw your video on Tibbs with the, uh, it wasn't the little Tib machine, but it was a, it was a strap with, I think a weighted uh it's is an ankle weight yeah it's it's just so what's there i was just gonna ask i never i mean i don't know how important i people talk about knees over toes training tibs it may be benefiting i don't really know what it benefits other than this part of your calf looks jacked and it looks really cool and it gives it some more girth so that's why i do it i don't really know how important it is for feet or what, I don't even know what the tibs do. So I feel like no, a lot of people would benefit from this because I don't know. Some people might know, but besides looking cool, what are the tibs, what's the main benefit for training tibs? Uh, theoretically, they decelerate motion. So when you hit, they work with the calf to decelerate and they pull the toes up in the dorsal flexion. But that's second the fact of, okay, let's just say your forearms, most of our work is done in flexion. So you reverse the grip for curls and stuff. Yeah. So you see the muscles in the forearm, they look good, but they also, if those are weak, then you get with tennis elbow. Because what happens if the muscle, this is tendonitis, if the muscle and tissue doesn't get nice pull, and the meat uh, pull is pushing and pulling and create uh, pliable tissue, it gets dehydrated, it starts to uh, de pull down like a pulling on the shirt, and that pulls at the joints, and most tennis elbow or golf elbow, or the, either the medial, the lateral, epicondyle, happens when the tissue here gets stiff and bound up because we're only here. So guys walk around, you know, they kind of got this curled in the inner thaw look because they're all flexor dominant. So working both sides of the equation keeps the healthy joints. They also develop muscle autonomy. And if you were thinking about, if you had to go and catch yourself, like you drop into a push-up, what's catching there? It's this muscle that is eccentrically, it's, it's, you're being pushed into a flexion, so it's, it's catching. You're here, and your fingers are being pushed. So it's the idea of dorsiflexion, pulling the toes up. So mm -hmm. it's the idea of reversing it. So just working on that. I do think that, functionally speaking, 
the biggest problem is because we wear shoes with raised heels and we're a little bit more dominant in terms of our movement and we only do one side of things. Meaning, I look and say, if you are actually functioning as a healthy, fulfilled human, then there's going to be a level of even uh, structural balance that develops. So the reason, the more interesting question is not why do we need to work our tibs, it's what movements are we missing that are developing the calves that are not bringing the tibialis muscles up in proportion to the calves. So is it the same thing as like, because I know that, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I'm trying to use the fact that, okay, if your lower back hurts, it's probably a weakness in your, or if you get a lower back injury, it's part of your glutes and hamstrings. Do you, is that the same? Is Tibbs like the armor? Does it help your calves in any yeah. way or no? The same way that, think about it, if you are all flexors and no forearm, then you don't have the ability. Let's just say you want to, um, when you're doing a bench press and you like, create torque in the bar and oh, you bring it down, bar. you bend yep. the bar, well, guess what? You don't have any extension ability. So in inability to create this rotating, we can't throw, we can't roll, we can't catch. An inability, if you just even do this for 15, 20 reps, get the toe fingers as well and open it up, what do you end up feeling is like, okay, these muscles are really fatigued. So there's a level of, they, they're missing the length, but they just, they got to protect the arm. They, they enable motion at the wrist, but also at the uh, elbow. So just like every muscle, there's a reason they're there. And a lot of times it's not just above and below the chains of your back hurts, not just above and below. It also can be on the opposite side. So your hip flexors that feed through to your, your base of your spine, those can also be things to pay attention to. Mm. What? We good? Should I keep going? Or? Oh, no, we're good. Okay. For sure. All right, that's enough anabolic activities for today. Episode with the niftiest guest, Barefoot Sprinter, a.k.a. Graham. Um, it was a pleasure having you on, sir. Look at those forearms. Mm. Those upper arm tibialis muscles. Mm. Yep, look at that. How to angle them. But, like the video. Drop a comment. We'll be in there replying. Let us know what you guys think. And go follow Graham, even though he has a shit ton of followers, and I have none. He almost has a 500K, something like that. So go follow him. He puts out great content, great reels. Apply some of the barefoot stuff, the tib stuff. Get athletic. Don't be fat. Be less fat. Think less. Not as much as I do. Think, have a great think day. Think more, actually, yes, if you're Kenny. Stay anabolic. <laughs>